this week on Sci-Fi Buzz, Anthony Stewart Head, one of the stars of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Vampires are creeps. Yes, that's why one slays them. Computer-generated special effects spawn a new generation of thrill rides. Harlan Ellison confronts internet rumor mongers. And remembering horror film legend John Carradine. Together we're going to our camp, the three of us, I swear it! Prepare. Stand by. The buzz. Movies. Personalities. Sci-fi. FX. Behind the scenes. Cutting edge. Get ready. With the buzz from the kingdoms of science fiction, fantasy, and horror, this is Sci-Fi Buzz, and I'm Mike Derrick. Have you noticed something that I've been noticing this season on Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Sarah Michelle Gellar, her character's a little bit softer, a few more romantic storylines with Angel, the well-mannered and very handsome vampire in the series. Apparently, Warner Brothers is trying to boost the ratings with more than just the cult following on the show. Well, it's certainly working for me. More from the set of Buffy a little bit later on as we interview uh, Anthony Stewart Head, who plays the librarian on Buffy. That in just a second, but first, Buzz News. A director goes ape, and a video game runs rampant on this week's Buzz News. Suddenly I'll sort of wake up one day and realize, you know, that there might be a movie in that. James Cameron, fresh from directing the hit film Titanic, is going ape. Planet of the Apes, that is. Sources reveal to The Hollywood Reporter that Cameron's company will begin revising the screenplay after the first of the year. But so far, Cameron has only committed to producing the new Planet of the Apes. All of Hollywood is anxiously awaiting to hear if he'll direct the film as well. <laughs> yeah, now that's what I'm talking about. Mortal Kombat, the best-selling video game turned hit movie franchise, is getting the Hollywood treatment once again, this time as a live-action syndicated TV series. New Line Television and Threshold Entertainment will produce the show with Warner Brothers handling distribution next fall. Though the number of syndicated action series will surpass 25 by next season, the producers of Mortal Kombat hope their show's martial arts action and high-tech special effects will help it stand out from the crowd. And that's the latest buzz. Any others? Well, for that, thanks. I certainly hope not. But. Kill vampires, that's my job. True, true. Although you don't usually beat them into quite such a bloody pulp beforehand. With his role as Giles, the school librarian on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, British actor Anthony Stewart Head has landed a choice gig. The cult series is one of the hippest, most unusual shows on TV. But precisely because Buffy strays off the beaten path, it hasn't yet set the TV ratings charts on fire. When you run into fans on the street, what do they say to you? It always takes me by surprise when people people sort of suddenly go, wow, I love the show. It rocks. Buffy's cool. It's great. I, you know, it's like there's people out there getting off on our stuff. Do you think it's coincidence you're being here? That boy was just the beginning. In the beginning, Head figured the show would be a slam dunk in the ratings. Seen as how it was created by Josh Whedon, the hot Hollywood screenwriter who won an Oscar nomination for Toy Story. We were surprised that it didn't get snapped up when it was first the first pilot, but it but Joss has always said, don't worry, you know, it's going to be a slow build. It's not going to be one of those that sort of everybody goes, ah, oh, that's the one. It's going to be like word of mouth is just going to build this thing. This is the high school. This is the high school. This is, this is the corridor of the high school. Head is aware of how hard it is for cult shows to expand their audience from his experience as a cast member on the short-lived science fiction series VR5, now in reruns on the Sci-Fi Channel. The producers were very much aficionados of the Avengers and um, shows from the 60s like The Prisoner. They love The Prisoner. So all the complexities of The, com the Prisoner, they kind of like to sort of imbue the show with. But if you missed a show, if you missed an episode, you were screwed. There was nothing, because, uh, who's that now? Head thinks Buffy the Vampire Slayer has a better chance of breaking into the mainstream since it appeals to a broad range of age groups. That's one of the weird things about Buffy, is the, the breadth of its appeal is extraordinary. I mean, the demographic was really supposed to be, I think, something like 15 through to about 42, 45. But it's, I mean, it goes both ends of the scale, and it goes off the scale. 
The actor believes the show connects with adults as well as teens because of series creator Joss Whedon's smart blending of chuckles and chills. That was his whole thing, was he always wanted to show that you can have real comedy and witty, biting satire, along with real thrills and real horror. And you can do it in, in, in seconds. You can turn the emotions around. Success, at last. The new playmate is a fellow of some repute, it seems. While Buffy has not yet become the kind of phenomenon uh, of that would make Head a major star, he's come a long way since his days as the male lead in the Taster's Choice commercials. And incidentally, Head wants it known that he didn't land his role on Buffy because of those ads. The producers came to me after I'd been hired and said, you're the Taster's Choice guy. I went, yes. Well, we didn't know. We put your picture up on the wall and everybody went, it's the Taster's Choice guy. But um, they didn't like that? They loved it. Oh, they did? Yeah, well, because suddenly they had some, something, you know, like, a little bit more bankable. Buffy the Vampire Slayer may have not yet slayed the Monday night competition, but Anthony Head is thrilled to be part of one of the most talked about shows on television. Next, Harlan Ellison stands up to computer bulletin board gossip. It would be just a nice thing to take a, a strap and whip these people into submission. And a tribute to one of horror film's most prolific actors. Sci-Fi Buzz is not your only connection to sci-fi information. You might want to check out every single month the Sci-Fi Entertainment Magazine, the official magazine of the Sci-Fi Channel. For instance, the February issue here is full of Star Wars news. They go on the set of Sphere, Barry Levinson's new film of a Michael Crichton book, and they have an exclusive interview with Babylon 5's Mira Furlan. Again, it's Sci-Fi Entertainment Magazine. My name is Beth Jackson in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I highly recommend almost anything, especially the funnier stories, by Spider Robinson. Not only is it science fiction, but it's some of the things I generally wind up reading when I've, I've had a real long, hard day, and I just want to read something fun and funny, and he does have a knack for making instantly likable and knowable characters. You just feel like you're among friends, and he had the, has the wildest things happen in his stories. Look, I'm a kindly sort of guy. Never an evil thought passes my mind. I, I love, I was the only kid in my neighborhood in Painesville, Ohio, who didn't step on ants. I never set fire to cats. I never did any of that bad stuff. But I gotta tell you something. Every time I look at these people who use computer bulletin boards, particularly in the world of science fiction, I wanna do something smart, like take an Uzi and wipe them out. Lots of them, hundreds of them by the thousands. I don't know who invented these PC bulletin boards, but all they are is back fence fetching gossip things for a bunch of people who have too much time on their hands and too little intellect. Now, look, I understand there's a lot of good information is given out over bulletin boards. I understand they do a lot of good works. I understand if there's an emergency, it's a quick way to rally people. But in truth, I have, I don't own one, you see. I don't have a PC. I use a manual typewriter. It's not that I'm a Luddite. I have all kinds of electrical and mechanical and electronic gadgets around the house. But I work with a mechanical typewriter. I work with a regular non-electric typewriter, and I like it. So I don't have, I don't have a personal computer, and I don't have one of these bulletin boards. But after I've heard the kind of gossip that is circulated, after I hear the kind of stupidity and meanness of spirit that is constantly being used and constantly being sent back and forth all night long across these bulletin boards, it would be just a nice thing to take a, a strap and whip these people into submission. I advise you that if you have nothing better to do with your time at three in the morning than to sit around in front of a PC, that you leave the rest of us alone and you go out and, I don't know, see if you can find the direct lineal descendant of Jeffrey Dahmer and let him eat your face. I drink to love, a union to last throughout eternity, a love free from all material needs. It's time to raise a glass and pay tribute to one of horror's greatest hams, John Carradine. I'm afraid. Although names like Karloff and Lugosi are better known, nobody made more horror films than Carradine. I'm no longer afraid. I will come for you before the dawn. 
With his roles in Stagecoach and The Grapes of Wrath, John Carradine became a respected Hollywood character actor. But it was the maniacal deviance he brought to life in hundreds of horror films that endears him to us fans. With his gaunt silhouette and booming voice, Carradine forged a film career that spanned almost six decades, beginning in 1930. Although some critics insist the actor did his best work in the early 40s, our favorite Carradine period is the mid-40s, starting with his role in Captive Wild Woman in 1943. He plays a scientist who turns an orangutan into a woman. Well done. Bring Karis to me. Wherever he is, guide his steps into these hills where I await him. And how about his compelling work the following year in The Mummy's Ghost? As an Egyptian high priest, Carradine finds Lon Chaney's 3,000-year-old reincarnated lover, only to fall head over heels in love with her himself. I'll take her back, Harris. Together we're going to our camp. The three of us, I swear it. So you are Blue You'll find another tour de force performance in Bluebeard. Carradine's homicidal puppeteer could take on any modern day psycho killer. Although he dies way too soon in 1944's House of Frankenstein, Carradine's portrayal of Dracula ranks among the best. Luckily, he got to reprise the role the following year in House of Dracula. In that film, he pretends to be seeking a cure for his nocturnal affliction, but is really trying to horn in on a good doctor's tasty nurse. Not that nurse, this nurse. But 19 inches, I mean, that's... Does that sound mad? That's what they call Mid Masters and Johnson's Clinic, mad. Carradine went on to star in hundreds more films until his death in 1988. His favorite role was his Long Jack in Captain's Courageous. One of his worst films, Carradine said, was Billy the Kid versus Dracula, a shoddy production at best, that permitted its Dracula to fly around in the daytime. Craig, what happened? I think something fucked with what's barking? What's barking, Craig? But no matter how campy or clumsily directed some of his films were, Carradine more than made up for them with the stunning work he did in the mid-40s. John Carradine is one of the unsung legends of the classic horror film era. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Come here, come here. Come on, come on back for a minute. After I got done with that, the, the producer, who's a very, very dear man, has, has only one eye, but a very sweet man, says to me, that's a little mean-spirited. You didn't tell us why these people are so bad. He said, I'll join your cause if you can give me examples. Well, what I'm talking about here is that these people are mean-spirited themselves. We're talking about unkindness to each other. Because they're at some far place in the transcontinental web, they think they can say anything they like. They're like bullies who snipe at you from the back door, and when you get close enough to hit them in the head with a ball bat, they slam the door on you. This kind of behavior is just simply cruel. They spread terrible gossip. They spread rumors that don't matter. One, one idiot in New York City recently spread the rumor that somebody had sold a story to Omni that had uh, been at Playboy and had been rejected out of hand at Playboy, and it was unreadable. Well, the story has been picked for the best American short stories. It's a perfectly good story. But this fool decided that it would be nice to bad rap the author. So he put it on the web, and people pick it up. And you hear these rumors repeated over and over again. They're like the chihuahua in the microwave thing, you know. I put my chihuahua in the microwave. I know someone who did that, and the dog blew up. Boom! Well, we know that's craziness. We know that it's urban fantasy. We know that it's Mythology. These bulletin boards provide people who are cowards, who have no integrity, with the ability to badmouth anyone they wish. And they get away with it because there's no law at the moment. What I'm saying is these people have too much time on their hands. They're kvetches. They're just yentas. They're not nice. Now you can go away. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Digital special effects revolutionize thrill rides. And our Buzz Best Bets after this communication from the Overlord. The 
A trio of thought-provoking new novels makes this week's Buzz Best Bets. I really appreciate it when someone walks up to every single one of my books, reads it, and then says, that's the best thing you've done so far. Greg Bear delves into the nature of consciousness in his new novel, Slant. Though definitely hard SF, Slant is a truly compelling, fast-paced story about the future of human evolution. We are changing, and, and there's not much we can do about it. It's, you know, we, we, we sort of have to roll with it. William Gibson's latest novel, Adoru, has just come out in paperback. It also explores artificial intelligence and human consciousness, but with a more rock and roll style. Gibson creates an ultra-hip, media-obsessed future Tokyo, where the lines between human and artificial life are beginning to blur. I'd like to make readers cry when sad things happen and make readers laugh when funny things happen and make them go off to the bathroom and throw up when really yicky things happen. And Neil Gaiman, best known for the graphic novel series Sandman, has just released his debut novel, Neverwhere. A blend of fantasy and horror, Neverwhere pulls readers into a beautiful and terrifying underworld. Here beneath the streets of London, the reader meets monsters, saints, murderers, and angels. These three new book releases are all Buzz Best Bets. The Buzz has learned that Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich are going to release their Godzilla movie next summer, even though it may have an R rating attached to it. Of course, PG-13 might be better for them because more people will go to theaters to see it. But the two filmmakers say that they will stick with the violent sequences they have planned for the movie, even though it will have an R rating. And action. In the new IMAX film, Thrill Ride, The Science of Fun, audiences are taken behind the scenes for an exciting up-close look at motion simulator rides. The film presents the history of the thrill ride and details how everything from roller coasters to attractions like Back to the Future work. Ben Stassen, the film's director, says the IMAX movie is a bit of a thrill ride itself. We kind of try to design it as a, as a film where the camera will be moving from the beginning to the end of the film and, uh, and try to, at times, you know, bring these rush of adrenaline by giving a, a burst of really dynamic uh, ride film kind of uh, uh, feeling to it. So that, that'd be a cool shot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they would be leaving that way, and next thing you know, they're coming this way. Yeah, yeah. If anyone should know about thrill rides, it's Stassen. The Belgian-born director has helped make over 17 ride films in just four years. These attractions combine film with motion simulators to create a wild ride for audiences. We create chaos because we're shaking people up, we, we, you know, we're doing some very dynamic stuff. We find a lot of inspiration actually from, from existing uh, attractions, whether it's a roller coaster, whether it's a dark ride, or we're going to do a, a, a ride on tracks. Uh, for instance, we have a ride called Glacier Run. These kinds of thrill rides have taken off in the past few years, with more than 1,500 ride simulators now available worldwide. Stassen calls this combination of film with ride immersive entertainment. Immersive entertainment is a kind of uh, entertainment where you tend to forget the frame around the picture. You think that you are in the picture. You, you're not looking passively at, at, a, at, a, at a piece of film or at, at a, a TV program, but you are actually feel that you are immersed in the experience. You are living an experience rather than watching a film. Most thrill ride films use computer-generated images, which are sometimes combined with live action footage. Each shot must be carefully planned out to achieve the sense of motion. We do an entire map of the ride, uh, making sure that we have continuity, making sure also that there's a good balance between very dynamic moment, somewhat slower moment, moments uh, throughout the thing. So pacing and timing is a key thing. And that's once we have selected the environment, we have our map, we then design every single sequence. We, we do big color drawings of every sequence so that we can have the, the visual design and have a consistent look throughout the film. Like today's big time special effects films, ride films have a healthy budget. The budgets we have at our disposal are comparable on a per minute uh, cost and sometimes exceed the permanent cost of big films like Lost World, Jurassic Park, Independence Day. Of course, instead of doing 120 minutes, we do four, five, six minutes. But we have f uh, quite a you know, reasonable budget to do the kind of work we have to do. And, and it's, it's, it allows us to, to kind of test the, 
the, you know, push the envelope and test the limit of the technology. As this new form of cutting-edge entertainment continues to evolve, expect Ben Stassen to be along for the ride. Hey, staff, the Jerry Ryan picture is in. Check this out. Of course, Jerry Ryan from Star Trek Voyager, the buzz on her is very good, very hot right now. But some male viewers, sorry, Allison, for all this, but some male viewers of the series are apparently a little bit perturbed because she has traded in this slinky, skin-tight, silvery outfit for a dull red uniform. Have you noticed uh, that? No. After all these magazine covers, you know, touting this beautiful silver outfit. So I think it could be Captain Janeway putting her foot down. Doesn't she look cranky right there? So I was thinking, if Jerry doesn't need that silver outfit anymore, Allison, how about you wearing it? <laughs> Dave? Sure. John? I've got one at home. Anything for the buzz. What? Chill out with Jack Frost when Mystery Science Theater 3000 comes your way today at 5 p.m. Eastern. Now, torn from the pages of your imagination, Amazing Stories is next on the Sci-Fi Channel.